Welcome to the Four Visions Market Podcast, a space built on the principles of integrity and reciprocity. Together, we will engage in thought provoking conversations about plant medicines, why these plants are coming out of the rainforests, jungles, and mountains after thousands of years, and what it means to be in right relationship with the ancestral wisdom cultures and guardians of these traditions. I'm your host, Mariah Ganessa, founder and director of Four Visions Market. This podcast is the natural evolution in our commitment to providing you, our tribe, with incredible resources to support you on your healing journey through plant medicines. Welcome home. Welcome back, Four Visions fam. We are super excited about this week's episode. I sat down with Andrew Soluna M., the director for Children of the Rainforest, a nonprofit organization founded and led by Iskakua Yawanawa, chief of New Hope Village, the largest Yawanawa village located in Acre, Brazil, and had a really powerful conversation that we're stoked to bring you today. Children of the Rainforest is a Yawanawa language and education fund. It sustains Iska Vakahu, the Yawanawa School of Language and Cultural Traditions for over 190 Yawanawa kids and youth. They're also on a mission to protect and care for the 500,000 acres of the Yawanawa territories in the Amazon rainforest. This conversation is an invitation to think outside of the bubble that is our own world and to start to see things from the perspective of interconnectedness between all humanity, regardless of region, race, or religion. Andrew shares about his own personal journey, how he came to be part of this mission, and more about the work they are doing and why it's so important. In this episode, Andrew challenges this concept of charity and charitable work and explains why the work they are doing with children of the rainforest is different based on reciprocity. Four Visions Market is proud to be in partnership with this organization, donating a percentage of our profits to the language school each month. This episode has a lot of incredible wisdom, and I think you'll receive a lot from Andrew, as well as getting to hear about the great work that Children of the Rainforest is doing. So thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy. A quick word from our sponsors before we begin this episode. Today's episode is brought to you by the Suma Kausai Music Festival in partnership with Four Visions Market and Finca Mbiwasi. We welcome you to join us in Colombia at Finca May 30th through June 2nd, 2023 for four days of epic music, celebration, teachings from wisdom keepers, plant medicine, and community building. Suma Kausai is an Ingano term meaning the good life, and this festival will truly embrace the joy and sweetness that this good life has to offer us. Headlining, we have some incredible world-renowned musicians, including Pia, Ajit, and Grupo Puto Mayo. Our lineup is full of beautiful medicine musicians from the Finkambi Wasi family, as well as Colombian musicians and some more surprise guests. Learn more about the event by going to tinyurl.com slash Suma Kausai Festival. That's Suma, S-U-M-A, Kausai, C-A-U-S-A-Y Festival. This is an all-inclusive event that includes pickup and drop-off at Bogota Airport, all food and accommodations, and all the incredible concerts, workshops, and offerings during our four days together. Due to the size of our center, the festival is limited to 50 participants, and we're filling up quickly. If you feel the call to join us this spring, don't wait. Sign up today to reserve your spot at this super special healing event. Well, welcome, Andrew. It is an honor and a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Mariah. It's a privilege. I'm really, really grateful for this partnership and friendship and sisterhood of our organizations. Uh, So I'm really happy to uh, be speaking with you today. Mm. Me too. Me too. I'm looking forward to this conversation and looking forward to getting to go into some of these really rich themes that are so integral to this path and to all those who are involved 
in plant medicine, involved with the indigenous ancestral lineages and the the tribes of the Amazon. And so it feels very ripe and potent to be talking with you today. And I'm looking forward to getting right into it. And uh, I thought it would be really beautiful to kind of open this conversation if you would share with us the vision of Children of the Rainforest, because I feel like it very much encompasses the theme of today's conversation. And I would love for everyone listening to get a chance to just drop into that prayer. I would love to. Thank you. We envision a world of thriving rainforests, clean water and abundant biodiversity where ancestral ways of nurturing the earth are honored and children learn from their elders how to care for the planet for all future generations. We believe indigenous communities in the Amazon rainforest play a crucial role in protecting and nurturing biodiversity and that they must be protected as their land and people are under threat of deforestation. We believe the most effective solution to protect the Amazon rainforest from deforestation and exploitation is to empower indigenous communities to remain on their reserves and strengthen and expand the demarcation of indigenous land rights. We believe indigenous languages hold millinery wisdom and functional knowledge of the plants and biodiversity of the rainforest that cannot simply be translated. When an indigenous language goes extinct, the biodiversity and land suffers. We believe that language is the heart of culture. When an indigenous culture loses its language, the culture is in danger of extinction. Without indigenous communities thriving on their reserves, what will happen to the land, rivers, and animals? Who will protect the Amazon rainforest? Oh, it's a call to action if I've ever heard one. really just goes so deep, goes so deep to the core. It's an invitation for all of us to start to think outside of our bubble of, of our world and realize the interconnectedness of all life, of all beings and all communities. And, um, you know, I look forward to hearing more about how you got involved in this incredible mission and sharing more with our listeners about what Children of the Rainforest stands for and all the good work that you guys are doing. So I would love to start today, Andrew, and thank you so much again for sharing that. It's a beautiful seed to begin this this conversation today. I would love for you to start by sharing a little bit about who you are and the way that you got involved with the work that you do today and how you got connected with the Yawanawa people for whom you have become a spokesperson and a protector and a, and a, a very important pillar within uh, the organization. And so I would love for you to share a little bit more about who is Andro Soluna. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's an honor. It's really nice to uh, share one story, you know, because our stories are always evolving. And I think we're always remembering parts of it and, you know, in circular fashion, just coming up, the past presents itself again. And I feel that is so present in the current moment right now with me in the Yawanawa, in the rainforest, and even this right here, me sharing my voice on camera is part of my growth. You know, I'm just, I'm in growth. I'm a person who is constantly humbled by how much I need to learn and continue to be present. So uh, first of all, it's an honor. Thank you so much. And um, I was born in Idaho in the United States in the high mountains of McCall. And my dad was born in California to um, Mexican American parents. And my mother was born in Toronto, Canada to Irish Canadian parents. And they met actually in Vancouver, Canada. And just sort of through, I guess, you know, the wildness of the 70s, you know, and found themselves in Idaho, also, but at this point they were in Idaho. And uh, in 1981, I was uh, born, my brother was born a year and a half before that. And uh, unfortunately, we, we left when I was three and the family sort of separated. So my my brother and I went with my mom to Toronto and my father stayed there and sort of went back and forth from California. 
And so I grew up in Toronto, Canada, which I'm very proud to say that I'm a Canadian. You know, I'm both American. And it's interesting because my father's parents, my grandparents were born in Mexico and my mother's parents, my grandparents on that side were born in Canada and I was born in the United States. So it's uh, something that I've carried that I'm not exactly sure where I'm from. It's kind of fluid. It feels like I'm from what's called North America. I'm, to be honest, I do feel a little unrooted and I'm not, I, that seems to be part of my journey, part of many of, of us who with European ancestry, you know, this sort of even trauma of our lineage is being cut off from our roots. And so that was really present in my early life, uh, cut off from my father's family and my Mexican heritage. And that was always a big question. Where am I? Where are, I don't fit in here. This is not my country. And of course, um, in teenage years with, you know, rebellion and stuff and early drug use, lots of early drug use and alcohol and things like that, it really shook my core. And yeah, to be honest, I dropped out of school and just had a really flourishing uh, career in <laughs> drug use <laughs> in Toronto, Canada, which I was blessed to be in Toronto, Canada, because it's a very safe place. So I don't know what would have happened if I was in LA. I'm currently living in LA, but as a teenager, it's or in Mexico City or something. I mean, come on, I was very privileged to be in Toronto, Canada. I, I did go back, though, to the United States when I was 22. Before, Just before that, though, I had went to Brazil for the first time. I got clean. I cleaned up. Something in me was said, you, there's much more to life. But I And I sort of broke free from the chains of a lot of substance use and not alcohol that came later. And you know, I went to Brazil for three months and was my mind was just, wow, I just saw how much culture plays a role in a person's identity. And my identity, my search for identity really began there. So I went, I went to United States, California, and I started to get in touch with my Mexican side of the family. And they had, they'd been separated. You know, the families were not in contact. So I was the first one to make contact in about 10 years. I went down to Mexico and um, started learning Spanish. I was learning Portuguese at the time and uh, I came back to LA and uh, I've been living there for the last 20 years. Yeah. So that's a, a little bit about that early. <laughs> I do think our early life is so formative and it's so important to understand the themes and the, the big questions of childhood. These big questions. It, uh, life for me is about questions who am I? Where do I belong? Why do I feel? And it seems very esoteric or, you know, not practical, but these questions come full circle eventually and they're coming full circle right now. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that. And I often feel that sometimes we don't know why things happen to us or why things happen the way they happen when they're happening. But then later in life, we are given this greater perspective of why we were given the experiences we were given and how they, like you said, inform the people that we become through our life lessons that we learn through the through the traumas and the impacts as well. You know, they they create the threads that make us the people that we are today. And so that's really Really beautiful to hear a little bit about your upbringing and and a little bit about the the story that led you to search for other forms of healing, other forms of connection. Tell us a little bit about that next chapter when you came into contact with Chief Eskokua, the Yawanawa, and how everything started to open up for you in terms of your service to the Amazonian rainforest. I think that word right there, service, was something that was always in me that I wanted to serve. Um, I wanted to help because what I needed was help. I needed someone to see my pain. You know, I didn't mention, but you know, my father passed, crossed over when I was seven and we had difficult times. And in my twenties, I continued to drink. I got clean, you know, from substance use that just rattled me to the bones, just shook my core and withered my, you know, meat away. <laughs> I was bones, you know, and, um, but made it back, but still was drinking, you know, and it's so casual. It's such a, such an easy thing to do is drink your sorrows away, even just casually. So it wasn't until my brother, unfortunately, crossed over also. And um, it's interesting, like these full story things. 
I don't know. I don't. I don't know that I think about him as much as I should. You know. So even this opportunity right now, we're just we're having a podcast. We're talking about. They, no, it's real. This is real stuff. This is real. This is real stuff that we're doing in these communities with these medicines on this path. It's not a joke. This is not casual. Stuff. This is real hard stuff for me. So, um, yeah, to call his name, Joe, he crossed over and it set me on the path. It set me on the path to get clean. You know, I had a choice, either go backwards or go forwards. And so soon after that, just by the grace of you know, God and creator, I found myself in an orphanage in Tijuana. Whoa. That day, you know, I have pictures from that day of just being like, what do they call it in the football when you're being like piled on with like eight kids and they're just like, oh, and I was just like, wow. And I just realized, wow, I'm just a big kid. I'm just a big kid, man. This is what I want to do. Like, I don't want to be so serious. I, I want to do good work. But so I spent the next two and a half years working in those orphanages. There was a network of 12 orphanages. I gave up my life. I had money saved and I worked there and I was fundraising and I just learned so much about charity. I learned so much about this American savior complex that I was going to save them. Who saved who? You know, they healed me. They healed my inner child. And it's the same with the Amazon rainforest. People go down to save the rainforest. Mm -hmm. Who's saving who? That rainforest is going to save you and then you're going to pay back. You know, so I, these years of working with an organization called Corazon de Vida, they're still operating. They're a wonderful organization. And um, that moved me into also wanting to get an education because I dropped out of high school at 16. At this point, I must have been 31, 32. I always thought, ah, maybe it's not for me. I just wasn't meant for it, you know. And so it, it, I, I studied nonprofit work because I said, I want to help, you know, these kids. At the same time, I found Yogananda, the Self-Realization Fellowship, started to learn about my inner world, just being quiet and listening, but also praying, you know, using the words, um, my words and reading his words, their words, the words of God, so to speak. And um, so I went to school, got a GED, did my time at junior college, went bachelor's, and then I found psychology, clinical psychology. And it was at that point where I thought, wow, this, what healing. Okay, that's when healing, something clicked and said, okay, this is doable. You don't have to carry around anger and sadness and addiction. And so at that, there was a moment about at 32, 33, where I gave up alcohol. I gave up everything. And at that point, studying psychology is when I also became aware of other plant medicines. Mm -hmm. And that is where my healing journey and also educational journey, I had the opportunity to experience, you know, plant medicines and get into my own psyche, get into my in my own healing. Also con congruently or in conjunction doing therapy. Therapy. Containing my anger and bringing it out and, and really psychologically sort of just understanding who I am, not just spiritual and emotional, but psychologically. And it wasn't, it was very soon that I started to hear this music, these chants. What is that? What is that? What? And they, the people, oh, this, this, this group, Yawanawa, this group, Yawanawa. And so right away, it, it, it just really informed the way I was partaking in these um, medicines, you know, outside of the rainforest mm -hmm. in Mexico. And I just, I found the Awanawa and just by, you know, school, Chief Iskunkwa uh, was in LA at some point and just through serendipity and synchronicity, I ended up meeting him and that was about five years ago. And since then I've, you know, graduated, I got my license earlier this year. It's been almost a year as a therapist. So I work as a psychotherapist uh, during the week and I've just been growing with uh, Chief Iskunkwa and, um, We've been working on children in the rainforest for the last few years. It's beautiful to hear a little bit of, more about how your work with service has really 
played a, a crucial role in your own healing journey and in your self discovery and how it's really kind of paralleled this this journey you've been on over the last 15 20 years of of self inquiry and getting to know who you are and and I think that that's really beautiful thing to point out because service, you know, oftentimes we think service needs to come once well ourselves or once we're once we're healed ourselves and and I think that that's a misconception because truly the service comes in in parallel with with our own healing work and it's through the giving back and through finding ways to be in sacred reciprocity in different aspects of our life that we receive more, you know, it's simply the law of giving and receiving. And so it's it's wonderful to hear a little bit how through your own healing journey it led you to wanting to be, become more involved and wanting to support this beautiful mission as it developed and as it came forward into what it is today. So I would love for you to introduce us a little bit to Children of the Rainforest as well as you know you mentioned this concept of charity and charitable organizations i would love for you to also share a little bit about what makes children of the rainforest different from some of the other nonprofit organizations and charitable work that you did in the past yeah i guess you know there was a formative experience down in the orphanages on christmas day I'll never forget this at this uh, one orphanage they called Hacienda, La Hacienda. It, had, it has another name also, Maria Inmaculada. And three different groups of Americans arrived that day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. And all of them brought presents and gifts and things like that. And, you know, I, ha- I was there from morning to night. You know, I used to spend the weekends there. And so... You know, the kids are doing what they're doing and they're kids and they've been through a lot of trauma and they're wild and they're beautiful, but they're, you know, they're, they're in progress and they, they don't follow the rules all the time. And they're just, they're wild. And I just related to them so much and I love them so much. And so when you hear ding dong, all of them, whoop, and they're in perfect, perfect, uh, uh, you know, posture and, oh, hello, everyone. And they just want the presents. So they get the presents. And as soon as everyone leaves, get out of here. Get out of here. they're fighting and they're, they're acting like kids. Next group comes in, ding dong. Hello, how are you? You know, and, they're, and so I just got this view of charity, like, wow, these kids don't need toys, man. These kids don't need even clothes. They have enough clothes. What do they need? I always tell people when, when we would go down, they said, what can I bring? What can I bring? I want to help. And I was like, the best thing you can bring, when you go down there, learn a child's name. And then you come back next month and you say, hey, Marisol. Hey, Eduardo. You remember that kid's name. You, 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 you remember what he likes to eat or whatever. And so it's this relationship that, and it's the same in therapy. The therapeutic relationship is the is the the the, the vehicle of, of healing. It's the same with our families. It's just showing up, just showing up and being in the relationship itself, and it works itself out. So charity, I've learned, I studied a lot just about. There's a wonderful book called When Helping Hurts. There's a lot. There's a lot of you know charity drop shipping. You know this American sort of um, chain supply. What do they call that? Like you know, oh here's the donation, do, 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 and drop it, and then do, 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 and then. Well, who are you though? You, they, they, you know, you want to go down and build a relationship. So, Children of the Rainforest, we actually really only formally founded the nonprofit this year, but it's in, been in development for the last three years because it's been moving slowly. I always say we move slow, you know, because we want to make sure that we're doing things right by them. Mm-hmm. And the fact that Iskunkwa, Chief Iskunkwa, is our chief board member. He's a board member. Every every word on the website, everything we post. I probably ask him too much. He gets a little, he's like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. But I'm always, I want to make sure, can I say this word? Can I say extinct? Can I say it's going, you know, can I say, because words are so important. So the fact that we want to take a collaborative approach or even a back seat and let his vision and the, the elder's vision, not that we're trying to be different or saying we're better than anyone, but I, we that's just for me. There's no other moral way to live in reciprocity than by in right relationship. And that takes time. And it's, 
and it's not perfect. We we get into arguments. We do. It's not. It's a. It's easier almost to just raise money and transfer it down. Mm-hmm. You feel great about yourself. You've got to post on your Facebook and Instagram live. You know, but no, you got to show up. You got to go to the rainforest. You got to go down there and see what what needs to be done. People go down and they bring a whole bunch of stuff, but like what is actually needed. So what was needed is the language is 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 uh, in um, grave danger of being uh, extinct, going extinct. Like how many indigenous languages, according to the UN, many, many people don't like the United Nations. So it doesn't matter to me what, you know, as long as they are doing good work, you know, good research. They say that uh, according to them, two indigenous languages are lost every week, are going extinct. Not, maybe not just indigenous, but language. All language is indigenous to, you know, people who speak it. So, yeah, that's what we do. Children of the Rainforest is a Yawanawa language and education fund. Uh, we're led by Chief Iskunkwa. We work at New Hope Village, Aldea Nova Speranza. And we fund Iskuvakahuhu. It's a Yawanawa school of language and cultural traditions. We just inaugurated it um, in October. As soon as all the the festival was over, 10 children went on um, diet, spiritual diet. So we're starting with 10 children. There is about 100 and between 170 and 190 kids in the village. Our goal is to scale, is to move, is to to in, increase our impact. But the whole goal, that's why we say language is the heart of culture. And a, a people without culture will be will fall. They say stand for something or you'll fall for anything. So there's a lot of influence, of course, of Brazilian culture and American culture. And if if people don't stay on their reserves, who's going to protect them? The Yawanawa protect 500,000 acres of pristine rainforest. So it's a school, but it's much more than a school because the the word school is chief of school. They never use the word school. They didn't learn in schools, right? They, so it's not a school in the way that we think. This is another thing about charity. Our team has to learn. To, we have to learn to think like them. We have to learn to speak in a way that that we're not demanding you understand the way we are going to do things. Let me be humbled and listen more. Mm-hmm. So, for example, there's two really giant um, plots of land where they go and work the land. They work and they're learning the language. They're learning the, you know, the the plants, they're learning about their ancestry. So yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. (laughs) It's so beautiful to hear you talk about it because it really has so much foundation in this element of exchange, you know, and, and being in relationship. And it's so beautiful because I think so many people who, Westerners who are walking the medicine path with the plants, they, they want to be involved. They want to find a way to uh, be in right relationship, but they need opportunities or a pathway, you know, and, and I really feel that what you guys are doing, what Children of the Rainforest is doing is such an exemplary opportunity for people to see how to how to do this well, how to do this in integrity and how to, like you said, not just come in with our own ideas of, of what is needed, but really be of service and, and ask the communities, you know, because like like you said, there is a there is a dis- difference in culture. And I've witnessed this and seen this a lot in my work with the Colombian communities and what they see that they need, it, it's something sometimes is is different than what we might in the West think is the the logical next step, you know? And in that, there's a lot of beauty because that is where this cultural exchange and this beautiful reciprocity really does take place because we get to expand our limiting beliefs and expand, you know, what we think we know and get to learn from these ancient wisdom cultures that hold the key to so much healing and so much so much potential for all of humanity and so you know i would love to ask a little bit more on this topic regarding how to be an ally you know how how everyone who maybe is listening to this conversation can be a part of 
children of the rainforest and and how to do it in a good way too you know because not everyone has the time or the space or the capacity to to go 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 be a part of the board of a nonprofit organization or to be more so hands on right but if anyone is utilizing plant medicines there is a desire and a need there to be in relationship right so i would love to hear some of your thoughts on how how everyone can go about doing this, you know, and how we can start to weave this right living and well living more into our day to day. I love it. Such a good conversation. You know, it's like, it's not what we bring. It's who we are. You know, you could bring a million dollars and I'm sure you go down to a village in the Amazon rainforest with a million dollars oh man, you're going to get gifts. You're going to get the biggest, best ceremony. They're going to, I can't say this for sure, but I mean, just ex- as an example, as a thought experiment, you know, you're going to feel like quote unquote, a king or a queen. Right. And even in that, it's a little <laughs> colonial, just the words, right. You're coming down and you're the, it's you give, I'm giving this, it's this thing. This thing is the value, but I represent this value. And this has many of us just outside of, of our, of our indigenous ways, you know, the, our value is placed on how much money we make. Our value is placed on what we give. Our value is placed on, oh, well, I, I can only give $13. Somebody recently donated $13 to Children of the Rainforest. And I swear to God, it brought tears to our eyes. The, 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 the intentionality of someone to say, I have a $13. You know, that you, you feel this person, another person that day, $20. I mean, it's, 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 oh, oh, but it's not a million dollars to go back. You can take a million dollars to a village, drop it off. You're going to go home feeling like I did it. I say, I, I, they're going to buy a well, solar panels, everything like this. And you're going to go back in six months. And what are you going to see? That money's poison, man. That money's poison. A lot of times, a wild energy, it doesn't represent, it, it has to mean something. And it's the person that, we, it's the people that we are when we go down. First and foremost, I believe that roots, it grounds the relationship. First and foremost, I have this problem because I go down and I say, okay, let's get to work. What are we going to do? Give me the budget. Give me the budget for this. I need to take pictures of this. I need to show our donors this. And because that's how I work. And it's good because I need to. But my medicine is to slow down and say, hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you in six months. Oh, my gosh. You know, and like, who am I? This is my constant journey. It's not what I give. It's not just I don't have to just give, 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 give. There's no end to that. There's no end to money. There's no end to it. But the relationship, so first and foremost, I guess just for us wanting to get involved in service and charity, it's to tune into our own value and our own morals. And first of all, it's a, it's a journey of learning. We have to learn that, you know, we, we have to learn what it is. There's a wonderful, if anyone's listening to this, they could just Google helping, fixing or serving. She says, you help what you feel is weak. I'm going to help you because you can't do it. I'm going to go help you. I'm going to fix what I feel is broken. Let me just fix you. Hold on. Let me tell you what you need. But you serve that which is whole, that which you see yourself in. So we have to see ourselves first and realize, man, we are full of beauty and wisdom and ancestry and lineage and culture and so to for us to get to know ourselves first you know not just for not first but as we're doing this to know that it's a personal journey of growth and to learn to read to seek mentorship there is mentorship out there so many people in these communities have this distrust of organizations, distrust of government, distrust, and I do too. But the shadow of that is this hyper individual. We have to do it this new way. We have to do it this way. You know, we can't trust them. We have to do it. And they just spin their wheels. I see it so much. First of all, we have to collaborate and learn by somebody who's already doing it. 
And if that's through reading books, volunteering at soup kitchens, volunteering at churches, imagine that. Many people in these communities have a very healthy hate of uh, organized religion. But let me tell you, there's a lot of good work they do. I learned a lot in churches, in the orphanages. I'm not promoting it. But we have to be open that charity and service is not just one thing. You know, that it's not just like I give the money and then we build something. We have to like go and explore what services, explore what it is. It's part of our journey with these plant medicines, isn't it? To get out of our own heads and to serve and to be uncomfortable. To not know, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't want to go to Skid Row and, you know, I'm full of stories. But there, one time in Skid Row, my friend worked there and uh, the, her, her, she called him her, her granddad. He took us to, to we, we went to eat soup and um, we're eating our soup. And I just noticed he was only eating the broth. And I thought, what, what, what is this? This guy, he's homeless, like he's without a home. He's, I'm thinking he needs to be eating. He needs to fill his belly so that he doesn't suffer. Right, me, I know. And at the end of it, he paid. <laughs> he paid for our soups. And I just went, wow, I need to calm down and get out of my head. And this guy, he needs to do, he should do this and be present because what he wants to do is talk. Mm. So we need to humanize so many people, dehumanize charity, objects of charity is what I call mm -hmm. objects of charity rather than subjects, humanity, you know. So go out there, go out there and explore the world of charity and see how you can humanize people and see how it humanizes you, brings you to your knees to realize how this, this functional money, money is going to change everything. We have to figure out the system. We have to build this new thing. We have to, da, da, da. where's your heart? Where's your body? So maybe I'm, that's my own journey, but yeah. I love it. I love it. It's 100% yes. There's so many gems in what you just shared, Andrew. Thank you so much, you know, and I think, wow, it's just letting that all soak in, letting that all settle in and ultimately coming, coming back to the reality that we are not separate and setting aside all of the illusion of our own separateness, our separateness within culture, within race, within religion, our separateness with, with, because of our ancestry, our lineage, our bloodlines, you know, our separateness because of the territories that we grew up in and our ability to connect with people from other places of the world simply because we're all human, you know, and ultimately it's a beautiful opportunity for any of us who are walking a spiritual path, you know, people who are seeking to grow, to heal, to wake up, to open their eyes and to see life as it truly is and as our birthright as humans, you know, our birthright as human beings is to thrive as, as creatures of the earth, as creatures of the earth mother and the great father, we are here to thrive with all beings of all creation. And so how do we return back to this place of interconnectedness, of thriving together? And I think what you were just sharing is really the heart of it. You know, it's like, let's let's let go of these shackles of separation and the judgments that at the cobwebs of our own mind and see clearly and see our brothers and sisters as they are reflections of us, you know? And truly the work with the Amazon rainforest is just that. It's a beautiful opportunity to recognize our complete unity with all people of, of the world. And especially to recognize that the Amazon represents the lungs of the earth. And so we truly are completely interconnected to the people of the Amazonian rainforest, whether we're receiving healing through their ancestral lineages or not. And so that's part of why, you know, Children of the Rainforest and the work that you guys are doing 
resonates so deeply with me and with the Four Visions family because it's such an it's a, such a sister, like you said at the beginning. You know, we're we're sister missions, and coming back to this place of creating more connection, creating more harmony, creating more empowerment. And something you said at the beginning was really beautiful in regards to, you know, really asking what do these other communities need and how we can truly be in in service to them. Uh, it really comes back to listening, you know, and and really being willing to give what's needed. And so, you know, there's so much that we could talk about here. And I guess I would love to ask you to touch a little bit more um, on this theme of Working with these traditions that are not our bloodline, working with these cultures that are not our cultural inheritance. And if you have any, you know, perspective or, you know, experiential knowledge that you can share on how to do this in a good way, because it's a constant conversation for for me and my own personal journey, as well as, you know, with the work that we do with Four Visions and the way that we're sharing these medicines that come from different cultures, it's a constant forefront of the discussion, you know, of how to do this in a good way, because, and and I guess I'll just share to to kind of enter into this conversation what I have learned through my teachers and through the in, the indigenous elders that I walk with is that these medicines are here for all beings. And that they, the medicines were put on the earth for all of humanity to heal. And so this has been the constant truth that has been gifted to me uh, over over my years of study. But that doesn't wash everything away. It doesn't just, it doesn't change the fact that I'm a Westerner in a white woman's body coming to partake in these cultural traditions, right? So how do we receive that affirming truth and let go of, you know, that the cultural policing that seems to take place so often of, you know, oh, you're you're doing this wrong and you're cultural appropriating. And it's like, how do we put that aside? You know, because that's not the answer either. And we have to really come at it from this, this conversation that we've been having of union, of togetherness, of healing for all and, and you know, coming together. But how do we do that with also the awareness, you know? And I think I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I think the short uh the short version is don't lose yourself in someone else's culture. Even if those cultures are very generous, more generous than maybe, I don't want to say should because that's, but after in Brazil, 500 years of invasion, genocide, exclusion, cultural appropriation, cultural genocide, Still, as Westerners, as European just descendants, we can go down and earn trust and be called family. But don't lose yourself in that. Don't lose who you are. Don't disrespect your own lineage. Don't disrespect your own bloodline. And this is my personal journey, you know. It's an, it's, it ebbs and flows with me, you know. I feel so connected and so enlivened by the rainforest and the, the prayers and the songs and enlivened. I feel like this is why I'm alive. That's a feeling. That's a feeling. And as we say in Psychology 101, feelings are not facts. <laughs> but... It's a feeling, and that's good. But don't lose yourself in the feeling. Don't lose yourself in the feelings of these medicines. Don't lose yourself in the euphoria of vacationing down in the rainforest, because that's often what it is, right? <clears throat> or the little weekend vacations of sitting in ceremonies and with with these things to be to pray to your own to your own ancestors is the biggest lesson that I've. God, the biggest healing is to have a deepened connection with my own father and my own, you know, line. So know what you're bringing. As Chief Eskun, Eskunkwa 
was say, he said, we have a lot to teach you. <laughs> and he said, you have a lot to teach us. So know what you're teaching. This is another lesson from the orphanage. All adults are teachers. Every adult. If you want kids and ha or don't, or if you have kids or don't, you are an adult in society and communities and you have an obligation you're teaching we are teaching by our not just our words but our behavior so what am i teaching what are the lessons of my people my community my family what do i stand for what are my my play, opportunities for growth how am i going to grow we have to be humble to be willing to be wrong <laughs> Because we're going to be wrong. <laughs> we're going to be wrong. We, you know, you said Westerners, but we, this Eurocentric colonial mindset is ingrained into us. Oh, all of us spiritual. Well, I'm spiritual, so I don't. Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm half Mexican. I'm, you know, I, I'm, you know, uh, ethnic enough or I'm, you know, we, we you're going to be wrong. You have prejudice. You have racist thoughts you have these things they're just in us because of the sh colonialism is about structure mm. imposing a structure and psychically your brain doesn't work like that it's like the rainforest i i see our psyches and our brains our minds our hearts like the fluidity and the wildness of the forest so when i think of colonialism i think of buildings structures roads zoom very so a lot of us we use our words very sloppy and very sharp without being aware of what we're actually the under the underlying col colonial structural misunderstanding of what it is to meet another culture for example questions what does that mean what's that song mean oh what is that what's that what about that what about that it's like <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa, 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 this is a first date, buddy. Like you just got here and you want us to tell you the our millennial secret. So you don't go to receive. You go to teach. You go to give. Te teach might not be the right word, but you go to share. Sorry if I'm going on and on, but so the first point would be don't lose yourself in somebody else's culture, no matter how generous they are. The second one is, um, you know, I, I don't usually speak in don'ts, but don't be a spiritual consumer. Don't go down just to consume somebody else's spirituality. And that's one of these under, we're not aware, we're unconscious. People go down to Yawanawa and they know the songs, they know some of this and they want to learn the songs. They want to know about the medicines. They want to know this, but like, you just got here, man. Like you just showed up and you want to know all this. Like, who are you? Like, who, like, not in a judgmental way. Like, who are you? But like, literally, like, who are you? Like, I, like, who are you? Like, be there first. Go on the journey first. People are very impatient. If you want to get involved, don't be so impatient. I shouldn't speak. Don't please be patient and earn the trust. So those are two things I think. I love it. I love it. We joke a lot about how these days you can you know, buy a feather crown on Amazon and call yourself a shaman, you know, <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy, this world that we're living in. And you really just nailed it right on the head. It's like, wake up, check yourself, you know, check yourself and, and come with humility, come with humbleness. And that's truly the best, the best approach. And, and if we do that, then everything falls into place, you know, and then, then we can really just come and and, and be in that place of sacred exchange of sharing, you know, and, and that's really what it comes down to. It's a sharing of cultures. And this sharing of cultures is vital. It's crucial. And it's what sets this time apart from any other time that our ancestors lived in. And it's what makes this, this age really a, a new paradigm. You know, the fact that we can get on a plane and get on maybe three planes and a boat and get down to the Amazon rainforest, it's amazing. It's unbelievable, you know, to try and tell your great grandfather that this is possible in 2022, 2023. You would never, ever, ever believe it, you know? And so it's really special. It's a, a tremendous honor and blessing to be living in this time. And it's, it's like I said, pivotal 
for the evolution of humankind, for the preservation of these cultures. You know, you were talking a lot about like what the what the Yawanawa needs to to thrive and to preserve their people. And part of it is definitely in the sharing. They too, all the ancestral tribes need to share and be not validated, but have the opportunity to share their arts, their medicines, their practices, because in this sharing, they they sustain themselves. They're able to sustain their communities. Their cultural practices are also uh, being respected and revered by their children too, because the children see that the, these practices, the ways of their grandfathers and grandmothers hold ancestral knowledge that people from all over the world are seeking out, you know? And I think that that's also so important because when the children value the knowledge and the ancestral wisdom, they want to go to the school. They want to study in the ways of their grandfathers and grandmothers. And that's important because in recent generations, many Indigenous youth didn't want to continue learning the ways. And that's part of why the languages started being lost for the Yawanawa and for many other tribes. And, and there was this like dying off of these practices because the children weren't seeing the point. They weren't seeing um, the benefit or they weren't seeing why that was better than going to a normal school and learning the normal language and getting a normal education. And so there was this manipulation of the values. And in that, over the last 50, 60 years, there was a lot of loss that took place within the Amazonian cultures. And so it's very beautiful to get to see tribes like the Yawanawa rising up, claiming their traditions, empowering their youth, empowering the ones that are coming and ensuring that these pillars stay and that these flames stay lit for the generations to come. It's truly an incredible thing to witness and such an honor to get to speak with you and get to get to be in partnership with Children of the Rainforest and all the good work that you guys are doing. And I, I would love for you to just take this time to share at all about, you know, maybe what you're up to in the coming in the coming year, and some of the different projects and initiatives that you guys are working on and how we can support your journey in the coming months. Thank you so much. Yeah, the Yelanawa and, you know, many of the Honi Queen, Katukina, or the Varinawa, the Puyanawa, the Shanunawa, Nukini, a lot of these, um, we, we know their medicines, you know, we see their, their medicines and we see their names, you know, Nukini, ah, people of the Jaguar, Nukini, Shanunawa, oh, the people of the Macaw, Shawadawa, Many of them live in the Amazon basin in the state of Acre in Brazil. And it's, it's, it's way west in Brazil. And much of the deforestation started more in the east. It's closer to the big cities. It's closer to Brasilia. And it's moving west. If you look at a map of deforestation, um, it's redder, it's reddest here, and then it gets orange, and then Acre is still green, it's still green. So we have another sister organization, the Boa Foundation, and what they do is they buy back land and they give it. Not just give it, they work in partnership with the Ashaninka, with the Honey Queen, because it's land. It's land ownership, it's land rights. People without land, what 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 else is there, you know? So first and foremost, uh, the the our the vision, yeah, is a world of thriving rainforests with clean rivers and abundant biodiversity. And what does that mean? It means taking ownership of the land. The Yalanawa do have ownership over five hundred thousand acres. It's huge. Ninety five percent of it is unexplored still. They leave it purposefully. They leave it wild. So what we do is Children of the Rainforest raises funds and helps manage and organize uh, the programs at Iskuvakuhu, a school for the children. Because as you said, you know, the majority of children do not speak Yalanawa. Less than 50 people speak the Yalanawa language, and there's 1,276 of them. Wow. Uh, in the population. You can imagine. It will go extinct. 
So this school, as we say, it's not just a school, it's a symbol of hope. It's a symbol of hope and transformation. And many people see the Awanawa jewelry and there's the butterfly, Awavuna. Hushahu has her center, Awavuna. You know, it's a, it's a totem, as we might say, the butterfly. What does that mean? Transformation. It's a new, it's a new, it's a new time, you know, for the youth. That means the youth are playing the guitar now. For the last 10 years, they've had guitars. The Awanawa, most people know the Awanawa music with guitar and drums. But it's all traditional. It was all traditionally chanted. But it is time for the youth. It's time for the youth, the energy of this center, this cultural center. When I just went down for the inauguration in October, the kids played the whole week. All, it was all kids, children, teenagers, teenagers. And so what we, we, we don't just want donations and funds. We want family and partners. We don't want people to go down as tourists. We want people to go down and become activists. To know that when we step on that land, that we're a part of it. That rainforest is a part of us, but we don't own that land. And we want the people who have cared and nurtured that land. As I said in the vision statement, their language holds knowledge of the plants that simply can't be translated into English and Portuguese. We don't have the mentality to understand the actual spirit of plants and the ways that they transform and work with other plants and work with the waters and the seasons and everything. We don't. It can't be translated. Maybe one day, but that language has to be protected so that the biodiversity can be cared for in the right way by humans. So first and foremost, we want family, not just donors, and we want activists, not tourists. So what that means is becoming a guardian of New Hope. New Hope is the village. It needs guardianship. You know, unfortunately, there's a lot of money. We need money to do things, to, to, to get gasoline, to, to, to get not all food, but some food. There, there's a, a big edible garden, and they're, they're, because of the cultural genocide, they lost much of their ways, of their food, of their, the way that they um, you know, feed themselves. So they were forced to eat in a certain way. So they're reclaiming the way that they eat. But there are funds needed to sustain that many kids. If you've been around like the orphanage, it's like things happen when you're with kids. Things happen, man. You need to have funds. We also support the elders in, um, you know, not we don't like to call it a salary, but a reimbursement or re, you know, so that the elders can be full time, that they're not whisked away by some emergency and having to go to the city and earn some sort of income to get something. So. A guardian of New Hope is somebody who perhaps is a monthly donor for Visions Market. You were our very first guardian of New Hope, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you were fundamental. You guys um, tithe to the mission. And it all, it all it goes right there. So a monthly donor is a guardian of New Hope so that the children, we're looking at the future guardians of the rainforest. So that these children can learn their ways. And let me, let me tell you, they learn quick. They learn faster than you would, you might ever think. Cause it's in their blood. It's in their, it's, it's a, it's the, the rainforest. Who's saving who? That rainforest enlivens you. And so this, we're winning. We are winning. This language will not go extinct, but we do need community and we do need donations, monthly donations or partnerships in order to sustain and expand. The idea is not to just have a school, but to expand, you know, and have other children from other villages and also inspire other peoples. They don't use the word tribe generally in Brazil, the other peoples. The Yawanawa have a huge public. Many people know the Yawanawa. Shanunawa, not so much the Shawadawa, not so much. There's many peoples that I don't know. They're off the grid and maybe they want to stay that way. There's many villages that won't accept tourists. They don't want them there. They know what happened. 
So this vision of Children of the Rainforest is to expand, and Chief is, this is under Chief Iskunkwa's vision, that he's a, a visionary to, to go and, and inspire and support other people in Akri to keep it green, to keep it intact before that deforesting, before the agriculture and the mining conglomerates get there because they're on their way. So going to our website, rainforestchildren.org, children of the rainforest on Instagram, sharing our content, signing up for emails. But first and foremost, dropping in with your own intention. This is a long-term vision. No donation is going to solve this. It's not even a problem that needs to be solved. It's a mission, a vision that needs to be held by as many people as possible. So first and foremost, it's a long-term commitment that if you want to go visit the Alnawa, if you want to do your thing, but don't just go and grab the culture and the spiritual tools. Commit. Let's commit to a five-year vision. What could we do with 10,000 people with a five-year vision? Come on, $10 each person a month. This is what we want to do. We want to invite people. There's no, it's not, not the amount of donation, it's your heart. And it's these $13 donations that mean so much to us. All donations are, of course, but these, 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 we know these are the people who are like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so. We will be taking groups down. There is a group going down in February. There's an immersion at School Vakuhuhu. If you want to go to Children of the Rainforest and send us a mes message, I will send you the contact for that. Children of the Rainforest at Gmail too is easy. Yeah, so come down and feel the energy of those kids. Feel a ceremony when there's 80 kids. The medicine is different. A lot of people on this medicine path, we have this idea of like ceremony in San Francisco or something, but like go to the root, man. It's bigger than a ceremony. It's bigger than you going and receiving and laying down on your comfy bed <laughs> and receiving, like go down and be uncomfortable and see this medicine. Like the forest is the medicine. The energy is the medicine. The, 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 the water is the medicine. The children are, are the medicine. So if you're in the medicine world, go down with a trusted group, not just to diet, not just to, I mean, not, I don't want to say not just, but not to diet only, not to take spiritual tools, but to go and listen and learn, learn how you can be of service. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for all your beautiful insight, your wisdom, your heart. I really feel the heart and the passion that you have poured into this project. It comes through as you share about it and talk about it. So thank you for coming on and for sharing your heart with all of us. We will definitely put those links in the in the notes and the in the, about this episode. So make sure to take a look and go visit Children of the Rainforest and uh, get involved if you feel the call in your heart. It's such a good organization and it is such a beautiful thing to find allies and and people doing good work in this world that are aligned with with these values and uh this mission, you know, because it really is one mission. And when we really tune into it, we're all connected. We're all united in this great forest, in this great, you know, climb up the mountain to return home. And so uh, it's been a true honor to have you on. Thank you so much for your time. Is there anything else that you want to share with the listeners uh, before we go today? I want to express my gratitude to you, Mariah, and uh, Four Visions Market for your support even before we launched our website. You know, that website took a very long time to make. <laughs> but we're, you know, it's not our specialty. As you can see, we work in other ways. But before we even had a website, before, you know, it, it really was a vision for Visions Market. It was a vision. We were doing it for years, but we hadn't really 
posted too much. We didn't know how to put together a brand and this and that. And, you know, and you believed in it and you've been a supporter since uh, the beginning. And that means a lot. You were our very first guardian of new hope. So I just want to express gratitude and say, I'm so happy. And how can we serve you? Hmm. We're doing it. This is the this is the service walking side by side, doing the good work, and it's truly an honor. It's truly an honor. I feel we feel so supported by Children of the Rainforest, and you know it's it's important for us to have allies and partners, and and to have you guys as a, a sister organization. It's it's a real blessing and gift. So just your presence and the good work that you guys are doing, it's an honor to to get to support and to be weaving together in this way. So. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You. <laughs> From everyone at the Four Visions Market family, we would like to thank you for listening to our podcast. We really hope that you've enjoyed the conversation and gained many new insights on plant medicines, ancestral wisdom, and much more. Please remember to visit our website at www.fourvisionsmarket.com for more resources and information on plant medicine and spiritual tools. And please don't forget to follow us across social media for regular updates on upcoming episodes. We are grateful for your support and look forward to continuing this path with you all. Until next time, take care, stay present and stay connected.